I'm an associate professor at the University of Guelph uh, in applied social psychology. And then, I, then now that I've started, I'd like to thank you, Julia, for, <laughs> for inviting me. This has been such an interesting workshop. I'm, I'm so glad to be part of this. This is really great. And, and, thank you for coming. We're yeah. Delighted to have you. And, and, and it's kind of funny that you talk about taking a shift from identity because as a social psychologist, I'm actually very interested in identity. And it is one of the things I think about a lot and, and do a lot of work on. But this has nothing to do with identity. So there you go. <laughs> These are the vagaries of how you, you meet in different ways. So I, I also want to acknowledge my, my colleague and co-author, Emily Christofides, uh, who did a lot of this uh, work with me. And um, yeah, let me, let me go from there. So <clears throat> um, I, I think it's kind of obvious by now from everything we've said that, that uh, the results of genetic tests uh, can contain highly sensitive information. Um, uh, and just for example, there is predisposition to diseases and, and also fam familial connections. So finding out that you had a, have a certain connection that you didn't think you had and, and vice versa. So I'm thinking of paternity and things like that. Um, and, and of course, also there are associated uh, risks for negative consequences for various different individuals or entities finding out this, you know, this uh, information about you. So for example, workplace discrimination, uh, denial of insurance, uh, denial of financial products, uh, and stigmatization. So I think when we talk about like privacy risks, that's generally what we're kind of talking about. And, and uh, I always love bumping into Francoise because you find out we have these like common interests that we never knew like before. We had this great conversation about, yes, but it's, a lot of this privacy stuff is not necessarily about um, um, harms and, and risks. And, and I'll get about into that a, a little bit uh, later. But just to kind of pre Sage that, uh, yes, I think we do have to be very careful about specific harms, privacy-related harms that, that can come from uh, disclosure of genetic information. But there are other things that I think are probably even more important that I'll, that I'll get into. OK, so now, when we talk, when we talk about, uh, yes. Thank you. So, so when we talk about genetic research and privacy, uh, there's actually a lot of scholarship on that. Has been for quite a while. Um, I think a lot of that research is though on um, publicly funded genetic research, uh, and and that's interesting for for a number of reasons that I'll explain in a moment. Um, but in that context, when we're talking about publicly funded research. Uh, we're typically talking about uh, genetics research, genomics research, a lot of, not all of it, but a lot of it in the area of health. Uh, and because of the, the high sort of value placed in health, more and more and more money is going into uh, biobanks, building biobanks, cohort studies, and more and more, uh, and, and the, the numbers are getting larger and larger, right? So we're no longer talking about 100 people, 1,000 people, uh, or even 10,000 people. We're talking about uh, the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging is, I think, 300,000 people. UK Biobank was originally uh, aiming for half a million, and they've far exceeded that. And then uh, researchers are still saying, and that's still not big enough to get the kind of statistical power that they want. So now they're, they're linking uh, across uh, different databases and so on. So that's what we're the, talking about here. So how do these kind of projects connect with the individuals, the individual research participants whose DNA is going into that? Well, uh, an individual, first of all, has to agree to hand over their, their DNA into a project like that, into a kind of a repository like that. When they do so, they, they undergo an informed co consent process whereby all the risks and benefits have to be explained very carefully in accessible language. And the person can still say no. Uh, and then after the person agrees, the researchers are bound to use the DNA and, and associated information only for the purposes that were explicitly disclosed in this very detailed consent process. Uh, and even then, even when people have agreed, they can still, they always have the right to withdraw. They can say, you know what, I changed my mind. They don't have to give a reason. They can just say, I'm, I'm out. Um, and on top of all of that, there's ethics mechanisms in place uh, uh, that, that are based on national guidelines, right? Uh, that not only the researchers but the institutions within which the, the researchers are based have to adhere to. And then there are also repercussions for researchers not following those guidelines. So that's, we're talking now in the, the publicly funded uh, domain. So what we're talking about though with the ancestry testing is, is a, a commercial uh, uh, entity. So we're talking about direct-to-consumer genetic testing conducted by 
uh, commercial entities, they were private companies. In this process, an individual also hands over their DNA to a company, but it's a private company. They may or may not be aware of the privacy risks. They may not have the option of stopping other uses of, of the DNA and the information or even be aware of it. Uh, there are also no oversight mechanisms that monitor the practices of the companies with respect to storage and use of customers' DNA. Uh, and then beyond some limited legal constraints, there are no repercussions for private companies using, sharing, and commercializing DNA and associated information uh, of, of the customers. Sorry. Ah, thank you very much, Julia. I, I apologize. Okay. So we're looking at a very, very different kind of situation here. And on top of that also are all the issues that Julia already mentioned, namely what happens when the company goes bankrupt, what happens if the company just decides to change how they deal with customers, what, what if their business model changes. Right? Like, this is all, so it's a very different kind of situation. Okay, so, so this is the, the background. And then, uh, so there's uh, two different uh, studies that I'll talk about uh, briefly that, that we did. The first one uh, was a project funded by the Office of the Privacy Commission, and I think that's how uh, we connected originally, um, where uh, Emily Christofides and I, we did two things. The first one was we were interested in looking at, well, what, what, do, um, what are the privacy disclosures and, and practices of um, these companies, and we we did a very we didn't do a very deep analysis. We we looked, uh, but we did a very sort of broad uh, analysis of what do they actually disclose on their website. So so for the the consumer who who finds out about this, like what do they what do they see? And then we did a second part of the study, which was uh, talking to uh, people, uh, either who had purchased a, a test or who had uh, thought about purchasing a test. And how do they understand the privacy issues of, of uh, engaging with the customer? So I'll talk about that first. And then I'm going to talk about a second study, which was a, a theoretical study, um, where I'm now taking these ideas and extending them beyond just ancestry and direct-to-consumer genetic testing into kind of the larger landscape. So to follow up on, on, on our conversation, how are we changing the world by doing all of these things and what might be some of the consequences and implications? Okay, so here's the study. Um, I should also mention that um, most of my research is in the area, not all, but most of it is in the area of health, and we were actually primarily interested in, in the health kind of claims of these companies, um, but we did also include ancestry um, companies, and so what I'm talking about here today is either for all the companies or specifically on the ancestry. Thank you. Um, okay, here we go. So this study was conducted in 2014 and 15, and we, at the time, we were able to identify 86 um, sites, uh, companies, and, and associated websites that offered uh, direct-to-consumer genetic tests to consumers. So we, we operated from the perspective of somebody in Canada. What are they are able to, to access? So it's 27 of these companies are Canadian, but of course, with all of this being online, you can access this um, anywhere. There were five different types of services that the companies provided. Uh, health, so health predisposition testing type stuff, paternity and relationships, ancestry and genealogy, prenatal testing, and then traits and talents, so tests that would tell you that you are actually really good at sprinting, even though you didn't think so. Um, <laughs> and then a, an other category that included uh, like forensic testing, uh, uh, infidelity, and, and a whole bunch of other things. So uh, here, so so what we focused on really is: um, do they ha do these companies have um, uh, privacy policies, uh, and do they and do they provide these to co to consumers? And uh, what is the content of of these um, policies? So I won't go into a lot of detail. There is a um, a report on this uh, that is uh, publicly available, and I'll have a link here that you, you're welcome to access. I'm just going to uh, uh, highlight a few interesting things uh, that I think are most relevant to what we're talking about today. So first of all, uh, up to about half of these uh, companies uh, across the various categories had no privacy policy at all uh, available. So they just said, we're offering a service, you pay us, we give it to you. So no information at all. And again, compare this to how publicly funded researchers, to the great extent of, of effort they have to go to to talk about these issues with anyone who's a research participant. And now here's the other interesting thing. When for many of the uh, companies that did have privacy policies on the web, 
the privacy policy so it, it was all just about credit card information and, and, and the fact that you're doing a transaction online. It had nothing about the fact, no, hang on, you're handing us your DNA and, and the implications. So very few, so out of the ancestry and geneal genealogy sites, so 28 sites that we identified, only seven of those had privacy policies that even mentioned anything relating to genetic information in the context of privacy. So, so the vast majority of them had nothing like that at all. Okay, now, now to the second part of that study, the uh, consumer survey. So what we did now, we, uh, we did a survey, we, we got uh, f uh, 415 Canadians uh, on this, which I'm, I'm glad we were able to do. 180 of those had actually purchased genetic tests. And the, uh, the, the other 235 had thought of, about purchasing them and had decided not to. And here, and here are just a few sort of highlights of that. Um, the most common uh, company that they purchased from was 23andMe. The most common type of service that they had accessed were, were Ancestry services. Um, the most common reason to purchase was to learn more about their family and or health. The most common reason not to purchase was cost. And the, the, when we asked them what are the, the, high, the what's the what are the risks that are most salient to you? They, they did mention privacy. Now, very quickly to the issue of cost. Something that I didn't know before we did the study and sort of was incidental in, uh, that I learned when we were doing this study, um, that you mentioned, Julia, that uh, you, you speculated that the, the information that we hand over when we purchase a test is probably a lot more than the, the, value, the information uh, we get from them. Uh, what, what I was very interested to find out that a lot of the business models of these companies don't actually rely on selling the test. The business model relies on getting the data and, and, and commercializing the data, the, the, the genetic data that they get. So it's explicit in the business model. Um, so, in, so then what do we find in terms of like what consumers think about what their expectations when they engage with these tests? So first, we've, uh, these, and these are just highlights. There's a lot more detail in the report. Most of the people we spoke to ex their expectation, the implicit expectation, was that their samples would be destroyed after the test was complete, which, of course, would, would never, ever happen. Um, most of them uh, did not expect that their information would be shared with anyone beyond the company, which, of course, is also like, very unlikely to be the case. Um, and they also expect that if data was shared for research, that this would be uh, anonymous. So those, these, I think, are important expectations. Um, and something else, I think that is, this is actually something, something we haven't talked about that I think is incredibly important. 35% um, of the people we spoke to had ordered the test for about someone else. So they had sent in somebody else's DNA to get the information about them. And, 30, and, and of those, 38% of those had done so without permission. So, so I don't know how many of you have. Yeah. So, 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 so a lot of the conversations, of course, re revolve around the idea that this is about me that I'm learning, right? And of course, it doesn't have to be. Uh, and so, of course, this also highlights all of these kind of risks that I talked about in my first slide. What are we actually worried about? Stigmatization, discrimination, insurance, like all that sort of stuff. Of course is much more salient if you think how easy would it be to get somebody's DNA sample and, and send it in. Um, I don't know uh, how many people, um, you, you must have, many of must have even seen Gattaca, right? Uh, there's one scene, it's a very, very short, very short scene, it's got nothing to do with the main plot line, where um, a woman goes to this booth on the side of the road and gives them a DNA sample and they go bleep, 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 bleep. And, 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 and the person on the other side of the booth says, you caught yourself a good one. Uh, so that you know you you you, ha you can you you can you want to get the genetic fitness of your partner uh, and you know you get get a sample and you you get it analyzed. So uh, okay, so we conducted this study in 2014-15. What has changed uh, since we conducted the study? Uh, well, first of all, of course, uh, a lot of these companies. I mean, the life cycle is very short, so I haven't done a, a follow up to see how many. Um, of these companies are still around today or and what new ones are. Um, this, of course, highlights the issue that has been talked about before, what happens when these companies go under, when they go bankrupt, where does the data go, and, and, and so on. But very interesting, of course, is this issue that, um, Julia, you also mentioned, is these new guidelines that um, some of the big companies, including 23andMe and Ancestry, have agreed 
to, to abide by relating to, to privacy. So I, I do actually think that that's a very good move because that, that wasn't there before. However, there are voluntary guidelines, there's still no oversight or regulation uh, relating to this. And, and something that I really want to highlight, whenever, when you see debates um, both in kind of popular media and in scientific uh, scholarly um, publications as well, often the issue revolves around consent and transparency. So the companies will say, oh, but we will, we will say in our privacy policy that you know, we, we might share the data for research. Right? But who reads those? Uh, and and the, the, the implication is always, well, you're being irresponsible if you don't read this. That, that's the implication. Well, you know, we put it there. Like, you, you, you are an uninformed bad customer. <laughs> uh, but I, I, think, I think it was, I, I'm not sure, I don't remember, I think it was Helen Nissenbaum who did a study many years ago uh, where what they did was they, um, two minutes, no? where they did, they did a study. Um, two questions. Two questions? Oh, thank you. They did a study where they kind of, the average web browsing behavior of the average person and how much, if, if based on this average behavior, if you were to actually read the, the, the terms of reference and the, the prior, all of those things you're supposed to read before clicking, yes, I agree, let me through, how much time would that be? And, and they estimated that it would, take out of fi- it would take one out of five working days to actually do that. So, so, I, so my, my take home from that is, is that it's not reasonable to rely on transparency and consent in the commercial sector. Maybe you can in, in the research consent environment, but not, not here. even in the research, it's doubtful. But you certainly can't in the, um, in the commercial environment. OK, so, so this brings me to my, the, the second study I want to talk about briefly in the last few minutes I have. And that relates to the fact that ancestry and genealogy testing is really just one uh, component of this larger trend of, um, of information about us being uh, collected, collated, made available in digital form, and shared and accessed and, and disseminated in, in, through a variety of mechanisms. And this is, the kind of, this is the whole changing world business that I'm talking about. So when we do, and, and I'm usually talking not, not to genealogy researchers, I'm, I'm usually talking to, uh, to uh, like research scientists, uh, you know, biobankers or genomic scientists who, who focus mainly on, um, well, but I'm doing this to solve a health problem. I'm doing this to improve health, which, which I'm not challenging. I think that's a great thing. I, I think that's a really good thing. I don't want to stop you doing those things. But... Uh, you are changing the world in, in a way that you are not acknowledging or realizing and thinking through when you do those things. And so what kind of databases am I talking about? So I'm talking about population biomass, as I mentioned before, cohort studies and genome databases. I think uh, this is at a workshop many years ago, at, at least four or five years ago, uh, the NIH estimated that they had, I don't know, I think about 20,000 uh, full genome sequences and 100,000 exome sequences uh, ready to be compiled in, in centralized databases. This is, and, and as we know, uh, sequencing costs for genomes are, are decreasing uh, uh, very, very quickly. And so, you know, I mean, we must have many, I don't know, do you know, how, I mean, how many full genomes, worldwide, how many full genome sequences would we have available now? Now? Yeah, it must be. Oh, well, oh, must be at least in the hundreds of thousands. It's, it's close. Yeah. 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 Not all publicly available. Yet. No, not yet publicly available. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, and that's and that's the full entire genome sequence, right? So, and this is only going to be increasing, and this is now increasingly being annotated with clinical data, maybe connected with genealogical data. Uh, so, so this is there's a lot there. Now, on top of that, add clinical and public health data. So, every time you go to the doctor, that's data that's collected. Every time you uh, fill a prescription, that's collected. Then there's public health data newborn screening, like all that stuff. All of these things are collected for good reasons. I'm not suggesting they shouldn't be collected. But it's becoming more and more available in digital, collated, collected forms, more and more available to disseminate. Then there's direct consumer genetic testing. Then there's social media. Uh, there's all the Facebook scandals, right? There's all sorts of interesting things that uh, researchers um, have figured out that they can infer from publicly available stuff, and of, even more so if it's through the social media net- networks. Then there's fitness trackers, health apps, and biometric data sensors. And I was told a, a few years ago there's, there's some computer games, some computer consoles that, that measure 
biometric um, information. Uh, they have a camera that's on all the time. If it's switched, if it's plugged in, it's measuring, it's all the time. And it'll actually vary the game difficulty based on the level of arousal of the player. And all of that's collected, measured, digitally stored. OK, so that's the environment I'm talking about. Two minutes, thank you. OK, so, so we, we, we wrote a, a paper on, on this kind of thing where what we were trying to think through is like, what are the, on a societal level, what are the consequences? Not on the individual level. It's not so much if you upload your data, what could be the harms to you? That's not the question. The question is, how are we changing society? And what are some of the things we need to think through? And we, um, we, we, the title of that paper is, we start, the first part of the title is, if you build it, they will come. And, and the reason we, told, we, we used that title is because we were trying to get at this idea of, you can have very good intentions for what you're doing. You, we're, not, we're not saying you're a bad person, uh, but you are building something. It's not, just something you, it's not just something you do and then people forget about it. You are building something. And once it's built, there are all sorts of things. You, when you can build a house, you can build a church for worship, and it can be turned into a concentration camp. You don't know what the things, what the affordances are of the things that you build. And so we, we, we sort of spend a lot of time um, working through on a societal level, what are the new, what are the potential uses of these these, these data collections in in ways that might not be foreseen? So one issue is forensic investigations. I don't want to talk about that too much. Civil lawsuits. So people are trying to access all sorts of database to, uh, uh, you know, for to prove paternity or not, for uh, for uh, inheritance things like that. Another interesting use uh, that we identified is identification of victims of mass ca mass casualty events. So with the the Asian tsunami, uh, for example then um, people tried to access um, uh, biobanks and, and databases like that. Uh, much, much more concerning, I'm thinking now, is denial of entry for border security and immigration, right? And, and, and how information from that's collected in one country in one context might be accessed by another country in all sorts of different ways. And you might say, well, you know, I'm in Canada, that doesn't, it's not relevant to me, but what, like, you know, what if, if, if you know, your, your children emigrate and want to come back? Or, like, there's all sorts of you know, scenarios there. Uh, I'm going to skip the, the health resource uh, one, but I want to talk about the last one, the facil facilitating human rights abuses in autocratic regimes. So so I spend a lot of time talking with um, people that work in, in research ethics and clinical ethics, and and especially in, in kind of like developed world context. And I think, we, I think we're all uh, privileged geeks. Uh, and we, we really... You know, we think of how, how can the world be a wonderful place and what can be the ethical guidelines that, that make the world a wonderful place. And we, we, I think we repress the fact that most of the world is not like that. And um, we, we wrote this paper uh, during the uh, US primaries, the, the most recent ones, um, before we knew what the outcome was. Uh, and it seemed, like a, it seemed like the craziest thing at the time that there could be uh, like a, a, a leading contender in the, in the primaries on the Republican side who would talk about things like, we'll have a registry for Muslims. Right? It seemed absolutely crazy at the time. Now it doesn't. Now it seems like harmless compared to you know, what's happened since. But, but now think about, just think through, like we have these, all these organized collections of data and somebody with that idea, come, like I want to have a registry for, or I don't know, people who have like Algonquin Siberian ancestry. Like, <laughs> Uh, you, you know, I mean, for whatever they come up with, and, and, and so, so we, I try, so we did a little, just a little bit of. I'm not a historian, just a little bit of historical research to find out. Well, are there examples that we can point to where people collect the data for you know very good reasons, but then that were yet, then used for for horrible uh, purposes? And we found one, just one very illustrative example during in, in 1941 um, in the Netherlands, uh, a, a sort of a population data system that was collected for good population health and other reasons um, was used by the uh, by the Nazis to identify Jews that were then sent to concentration camps uh, and the uh, and in the Netherlands the the death rate of, of Jews was uh, I think something like 73 uh, percent which was an order of magnitude higher than than in, in other com comparable countries so I'm not saying that these things are bad and that they shouldn't be done but I'm saying that we have to think this through what what what, how are we changing? What are we making available? And now the other thing that always people look at me like, you're so crazy. Like that, you know, that why even think, like you're off on the rocker. But Russian hacking uh, is, is a real thing. Um, and uh, when, when um, Genetic Alliance in the, in the US 
uh, when they went, uh, when they started building their their platform uh, for for uh, like a registry to across all kind of illness conditions, um, they they were visited by by FBI and others and said, you know, well now that you're building this, we need to talk to you about how can we secure this, like because to at least make it, we we can't secure it, we can't actually secure it. We can just make it a little bit better. Um, and so when we built these things. Um, Dan, your second class. Oh my gosh. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I'm putting this slide up there because because I have to because people always say, "Well, what can I do?" Okay, here's what you can do. Find out if you, when you if you decide to do this test, what information is collected about me, what is done with my DNA sample after I received my results, how is this information used by the company providing the test, who can access my DNA sample and information, what third parties will my DNA sample information be shared with. How securely is information about me stored? Okay, that's that's just so I've said it now. What do we now? What do we really have to do? I think on a societal co- uh, level, we have to ask these questions. What does it mean to live in an environment where an increasing amount of personal information about me is available in digital form, organized, analyzed, and ready to either share legitimately or hacked illegitimately? And then, what new mechanisms can we envisage to ensure that this information is used in ways that enhance our individual and collective well-being? so that we move together into a, into a, a positive direction. Um, so I'll, I'll, uh, thank you uh, to um, again to the, the Privacy Commissioner for funding. And, and as I mentioned, there's a report of this available for downloading there. Thank you. Um, so we'll take one quick question and then... Uh, and then we'll have Francois's presentation, and then we'll come back to this whole uh, scary scenario. No, we're trying to think about it positive. Positive, 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 well-being, positive, well-being, 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 okay. So we'll have time for all three of them. Yeah, give us one. Sure, okay. Um, so, so 23andMe, you mentioned, for health information. Um, do you think that the draw to access one's health information or to better understand their health identity is in some way really an indictment of the healthcare system and the way that we're being provided and therefore implicitly perhaps not being provided a really comprehensive and patient-centered model of healthcare? And where does patient-centered um, start to lack consideration of identity insofar as people feel that 23andMe can bridge those gaps? Yeah, that's a big one. <laughs> yeah, thanks. thanks. Yeah, yeah, you're welcome. Okay, there's a lot in there. Okay, so that was so actually my question as a health major. I had to ask. <laughs> <laughs> so okay, so okay, number one, problems in the healthcare system. Yeah, okay, sure, lots, uh, so many, so many that I don't even want to start. Um, but uh, you know, how shall I say this? Um, there are many, many areas in life, many areas, many parts of our system that have problems and huge gaps. That doesn't mean that somebody who comes and sells your solution is actually providing a solution to that problem. And I would question whether 23andMe is actually providing that solution. I, my, my, my sense is no, they're, they're not. So yes, there are gaps. Yes, there are problem, problems. Now, how many, so the whole issue around personalized medicine, the, the word personal is it's so problematic because um, what what do different mean when they say personalized medicine? Um, in 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 the typically in the genomics world, what they mean is that it's more tailored towards your particular genomic genetic makeup. But per, we could also mean that personalized medicine. So, for example, um, there's some very interesting studies that go back way back about uh, quitting smoking, uh, and um, you know, it's it's if you have the the factual evidence, like it's obvious you should quit smoking. It's a bad idea. But then there's some interviews with with uh, uh, this in particular was was uh, mothers of um, in, in living in like uh, sort of urban gangland type type countries and they say, you know should you should be talking like you know I don't know if my kid's gonna come home alive or with a bullet wound like smoking is not a high priority like the risk of smoking is not a high priority so we we need to personalize all sorts of health advice and i think we as we've said before we can't use genetics and genomics to kind of capture the world it, it's it's not it our identity is not about genetics and our health is about a lot more than genetics <laughs>